8.55 Eastern Time, and Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. On three fronts, the Finns won important victories today. But in the far north, Russian tanks and mechanized columns, aided by bombing planes, drove them out of their positions at Pitka Yerevi and in full retreat to the southward. For once, the Russian communique understated the Red Army's successes, claiming considerably smaller gains than are reported by neutral correspondents on the nearby Norwegian frontier. The Finns apparently mean to make a stand at Ivalo, which is about 120 miles from the Arctic Ocean, 160 miles north of the road and railroad junction of Rovaniemi, and some 200 miles from the head of the Gulf of Bothnia. A Russian drive toward Rovaniemi from the eastward was driven back today, and of course this northern attack is still a long way off, but the Russian mechanized forces seem to be moving fast. Another proof of the advantage the Russians get from mere numbers. The Finns can't stop them everywhere at once. And on this northern front, they seem to have used their best troops and their best equipment. The Finns stopped them thoroughly today in the neighborhood of Suomosalmi, where they claim to have completely destroyed three Russian regiments which were dislodged from their positions a few days ago. For the moment, the dangerous Russian attacks in central Finland seem to have been brought to a standstill, and the question now is whether the Finns can shift enough troops to the northern front. On the Karelian Isthmus, Russian assaults were again repulsed. The Finns say they destroyed 36 tanks today and a total of 212 since the war began. But the Russians still have about 5,000 left. The 1st Division of Canadian troops under Major General Andrew McNaughton disembarked in England yesterday and today and will undergo some training there before going to the front. The transport fleet that carried them made the trip in a week under heavy ex- escort of warships. The biggest air fight of the war took place off the German coast, apparently all the way from Wilhelmshaven to the Danish frontier, but it's pretty hard to find out what happened from the stories told by the opposing sides. The Germans say they shot down 34 British planes and lost only two of their own, whose crews saved themselves by parachutes. The British say they lost only seven, not 34, and brought down 12 Germans. A few bombs were dropped at Wilhelmshaven, but apparently they missed their mark. Winston Churchill, in a broadcast this afternoon, said that within the past week, British submarines had sunk one German light cruiser and torpedoed two others, which, he said, may have been able to limp home, but will be out of action for quite a while. Reporting on the naval action off Montevideo, he said that for a time, the only British ships watching for the German pocket battleship Spee to come out were the three that had fought her, two of which had been badly damaged themselves, so the Germans perhaps had a better chance to escape than they knew. The German newspapers and radio still represent the operations which ended in the Spee being blown up by her own crew as a victory and say that she demonstrated her superiority over enemy craft. But Berlin dispatches suggest that one reason the news of the air air battle was broadcast so rapidly over the country was to offset the impression created by the sinking of the battleship. Captain Hans Longsdorf of the Spee and most of his crew crossed the Rio de la Plata and were landed in Buenos Aires today where the Argentine government announced that they would be interned as provided by the Hague Convention until the end of the war. Those who stayed in Uruguay will be interned also. They had claimed that having sunk their ship, they ought to be regarded as shipwrecked seamen and allowed to go free, but this doesn't seem to have impressed the Argentines. The German government has sent a protest to Uruguay for not letting the ship stay longer, but it is pointed out by authorities on international law in this country that a neutral nation has a right to regulate such matters under its own laws, and that Uruguay, like the United States, signed a convention in 1928 which prohibits repair of damage done by enemy gunfire. Several ship sinkings today, but all small. A Norwegian freighter was mined and sunk with five killed, which brings the number of neutral Norwegian lives lost in the mine and submarine campaign to 99. German airplanes in the past two days have attacked many trawlers and other small craft off the British coast and have sunk half a dozen of them. The Tokyo radio tonight again attacked the Russians for lukewarmness and delay in making a fisheries treaty with Japan and says that it is reported that Russia wants Japan to cede her the North Manchukuo Railroad. It is out of the question, says the broadcast, that Japan will consent to such an illegal demand which shows the insincere attitude of Russia. And the Maritime Commission gave permission to the United States lines to put the big liners Manhattan and Washington back into service, running to Italian ports outside the combat areas. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.